Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. I am sitting in the Fulham home of Nell Dunn, who has had a varied career, starting out as a novelist, getting involved in film and also theatre. Nell, welcome. Thank you. First of all, I'm just fascinated, I'm always fascinated how people become writers. So did you always want to be a writer from when you were two years old? I always wanted to be a writer for a long time. But thinking about it, I realised that when I was young, you know, men were very much the important ones and women were thought to be rather boring. And if you had a housewife on your passport, you know, you had no status, you had no glamour. So I think I was ambitious for that reason as well. And the writing, could you always write when you were at school? Were you known as Uh, someone who could write? When I was at school, I did write. And I did get encouraged by the English teacher, who who also gave me books to read, the classics. and So I was well read. Yeah, that's always a very helpful start, isn't it? And pretty young, you were writing short stories very successfully... Um, I wasn't that young. I'd actually been sending things in for seven years before I got published. And I got published, I think, in 1962. I was about 26. We have different views on what is young for a (laughs) published writer. 26 sounds pretty young for a published writer to me. And that was up the junction. Yes. um, Which started out as a book of short stories and then became, got filmed as well. Yes, By Ken Loach. By Ken Loach, yes. So there's the Ken Loach connection, which we'll be coming back to, I have no doubt at all. Did you realise that you'd written something that was going to be iconic, maybe overstating? It was going to be iconic? Absolutely not. Completely not. (laughs) I just wrote about what was going on around me. And and, and I suppose um, that that whatever small talent I have, and, and I think it might be quite common in playwrights, is that I could... If I heard somebody speak for a few days, I could then almost speak in their voice. And that was just... It just happened you could do that? It just happened I could do it, and I enjoyed doing it. So, in other words, um, if if somebody I got to know in the street, and I then wanted Mm. to put them into a situation where they got murdered Mm. or something, I would sort of be able to pick up how they they spoke. And And that was across all kind of classes, types of people, genders... You could just do it. Yeah, no, I'm not so good on men, I don't think. I'm much better on women. <laughs> that's a confession. <laughs> uh, no, that, that's fascinating. And as you say, that is something that naturally leads towards becoming a playwright, becoming probably a film scriptwriter. I think so. I think particularly a playwright. Mm. So you wrote, the, you wrote the short stories, you sent them off to publishers, you sent lots of things off to publishers, and eventually you got accepted. Yes, I sent them to the New Statesman. Right, yes. And the New Statesman yeah. started publishing them. And once they published one, they just wanted more? Were you yes. pushing them or they were demanding no, them? I wasn't pushing them that much. <laughs> no, they, they, I sent them in and they took them. And then that became a series that was then published? Yeah, and then a publisher approached me to, for Up the Junction. So that was the next thing that happened. And then you and Ken Loach, so how did... And Kenneth Loach, as he was called at that time, yes, possibly. How yes. did you and Ken Loach get together? Was it um, luck? Through, through a, a, a friend, interestingly enough, Christopher Logue, a poet. Mm, yes. Um, through him, he suggested to Ken that he should read Up the Junction. And when you first met Ken Loach, what was his state? Was he completely unknown? Was he... He'd done some stuff for TV? he might have been known. He was working for the BBC because Up the Junction was a Wednesday play. Yeah. And um, he, was, he was young, and he, he wanted to have a go at filming Up the Junction. And so we spent a lot of time walking around South London, finding places and looking at places. So you hadn't kind of got in your... Or he, he and you, between you, hadn't got in your mind specific place that had to be regardless of anything. It was kind of looking around South London yes. to find the right locations. Yes. And did you find it easy to work with him? Very easy. Very easy because he, he knew what he wanted. And so he would say, you know, I need this in just pure dialogue. And, 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 I, and I could do that. That sometimes doesn't work when a director knows what they want and a writer knows what they want. That can be a disaster. Well, no, I love being told um, <laughs> what's wanted. As long as I then are allowed to do my thing, 
being told what's wanted is make, makes it much simpler. Up the junction, so I, I, forgive me, I'm, I'm too young, it was about 50 years ago, but up the junction just caused an incredible sensation. Yes, I think, I think the reason for that was it, um, a pro, it, it showed backstreet abortion. I think that was the big thing, really. And um, the, this thing, I remember, there was a family planning clinic, the big notice outside saying family planning clinic free, you know. But if you went in, first thing they asked you is, are you married? And if you weren't married, you couldn't, you, you couldn't use the family planning clinic. And this was in the 1960s? End of the 50s. I went there in 59. But it would have been into the 60s, yes. Which just seems remarkable that 50 years old. <laughs> yes. Everything, well, I suppose we hear about the swinging 60s and everything probably changed very soon after that. Censorship yes. disappeared, etc. Yes, yes. And you didn't get censored? No. That was interesting. You literally it? didn't get censored. So the script that you, deliv- you delivered to Ken Loach that got filmed was... Yes, yes. How fascinating. Well, I think his explanation was we did it in August and everybody was away. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. So nobody saw it. And d- did it literally change your life? Did it change your perception of who you were and what you were doing? Um... I hope not. I mean, I'd wanted to be a writer. I'd been working for seven years, mm. getting stuff sent back, which mm. I sent in. Um, and so uh, it, it, I don't think it did change me that much. I think, you know, I think writing's hard work. And if you do it, you just get on and do it. And you do it because, for many different reasons, but, but mostly because, you, you know, you feel ambitious to achieve something, I think. And get recognised. I don't. I see it now as a, you know, in a way, rid- ridiculous to put it on any kind of pedestal. You know, what matters is life, and not writing. Absolutely, but you portrayed life in such a way that people wanted to read about it, which well, is that, significant. That, and so. also the kind of life you portrayed, because I assume back then that the kind of people who tended to be in novels were Hampstead novelists writing about novelists who lived in Hampstead. Well, there were there were. Um, there was the angry young men. I mean, yeah. Osborne and David Story and, uh, and Kingsley Amos probably Kings- was a novelist in that yes, category. Yes, yes. So they'd all been writing before I mm. appeared, but there weren't many women. Angry young women, no. No, there weren't many. There were some, but there mm. weren't many. And the, the degree of success. I happened to dig out from my bookshelves a first edition of Poor Cow, written in 1967, by which time Up the Junction had sold 500,000 copies. Yes. And I don't know what the number is now, you must know, but it must be into millions, presumably. Well, it's remained in print, which is very um, pleasing to yeah. me. And again, again was, it, was that something... You probably weren't expecting it, but could you imagine that 50 years on it would still be in print, having been in print right the way through? No, I suppose I didn't think like that. Mm. You sort of thought by the day. When you're, when you're young, you sort of think by the week. Yes. Uh, moving on, let's move on to Poor Cow. The, one of the reasons we're speaking is that a new, I can't remember the word, but I think remastered will do. A new remastered version of Poor Cow is just about to come out in cinemas, on Blu-ray and on DVD. And I've had a very quick glance and it does look fantastic. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's all, almost it looks too beautiful because you're trying to think this is the mid 1960s and the, the picture quality, sound quality are so good it feels as if it could almost be today. Well, that must be a professional opinion because I, w- I wouldn't know. I'm, I'm not that professional either. It's, yeah. it's, it's more an opinion just looking at it, not thinking, "Gosh, this is terrible. There are cracks here and yes. jumps there yes. and so on," which I presume someone has worked very hard to remove. Yes. And Poor Cow was your first novel. Yes. And what led to that? Because, again, gritty. Um, again, I was writing about wh- wh- who and what was around me and what was happening around me. And I was obviously v- very interested in women. So I wanted to write what it was like being a young woman at that time with, with, with no money and no um, profession. And you have a protagonist who... Trying to work out the best way of describing it. Who sit well? She she fell into bed in most senses with criminals, and therefore she had very little hope. Well, not only criminals, the people she fancied. She loved the men. She loved whoever she was with. She had, a, a, she, which I think is interesting. So it didn't really matter that she did go 
change from man to man because each one she really loved. Mm. But no sense of permanence. Well, maybe she would have liked a sense of permanence. Maybe but she didn't. Maybe she didn't. Very hard to know. And again, that well, that may have been something that was common in the mid nineteen sixties, but it probably wasn't something that was acknowledged. Maybe not. I was asked on live television at the time um, that didn't <clears throat> I feel that what I had done was very wrong because I was promoting promiscuity. And my reaction was, I thought it was terribly funny. Mm. But actually, I said, in a way, I believe in promiscuity because promiscuity is only looking for somebody to fall permanently in love with. And he was quite taken aback. I was very proud of my life. <laughs> and did you, did you realise when you were writing, do you think, gosh, I'm writing about promis- uh, promoting promiscuity? No. I would assume that might be the I answer. I was writing about real life. Mm. So... Are your female characters... I'm asking in the middle of the interview rather than the end. Are your female characters based on an amalgam of individuals, based on individuals, based on types, or based on pure invention? We have lots of choice. Well, um, certainly not types. Um, individuals plus invention. Uh, what I was saying in the beginning, that mm. I can pick up on the way yes. someone thinks mm. and use, find their language... But was there somebody who, when Poor Cow was published, said, gosh, that's me? No. <laughs> Is that only because they didn't read it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you're writing about people who are different from yourself, but you mix with. That's probably a reasonably fair comment. How much of yourself actually ends up in your female characters? I think a lot. And is that deliberate? Is it accidental? You just write and that's where you end up? Well, that's where I end up, because, you know, I'm writing about women and... In, in that case, I'm writing about a young woman. So, yes, I bring, bring myself into mm. it a lot. So to that point, you'd written some short stories, a novel, a book of interviews with women. Talking to women, Talking yes. To conversations, women. they yes. were, rather than interviews. I apologise, conversations <laughs> with women. Um, and probably got rather further on, you then moved into theatre... Yes, a lot further on, actually. Yes. It was 1981, I think, Steaming came. Yes, and Steaming was the big success. Yes, which that is, was the first play. And probably still produced today somewhere, I imagine. Um, I think the last time was about a year ago. And not a good production. Right, that probably counts as close to today. And yes. suggests there'll be more going... Again, again, a play absolutely about women... Yes. Is there any man in it at all? There's a man who, I don't think he appears, and you hear his voice, <laughs> you, you hear his voice shouting. I think we'll count that as a play about women. <laughs> and that, that is possibly slightly different because it is conversations between, I can't do the number, but four or five six. leading roles. Six. Six, 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 six in all. Two. Yes. Again, was it conscious that you decided to have a variety of women, different classes, different ages? No, I think the truth was... I started going to the steam baths in Hackney and, you know, became very interested in the way women spoke to each other when they had a whole day together. Mm. And so that, it really came from chance. And then it became, or it becomes deeply political, but kind of on a microscopic scale, microcosmic (laughs) scale. Uh, Once again, I didn't write it as political. I wanted to say what was happening around me. Perhaps that is political, I don't know. It, it's, it, it ends up with the steam baths closing or about to close. Yes. I, I bet not spoil it or not closing, as the yes. case may be, the possibility yes. that they might close. Yes. Um, was that based on real life or that was you...? Yes, they were closing like anything at that time. And did it have that kind of potent reaction on the people in there? Probably it did. Yes, it did. They were incredibly upset. They didn't do what the play does, which they get, get a, a, a challenging gang together to try and stop it. But um, certainly people were very upset because it was a special place for them. And did it close? And it closed. And did you follow them afterwards? You know what happened to them? No, but I mean, it wasn't just a few people. There were a lot of people. No, I'm sure. I just... Mm. A lot of people used it. I just did, you know, five characters or six characters. Did you find playwriting very different from... Writing for, well, novel, well novels was, probably yes, screen probably less so. Yeah, no, it was very different. I found it terrific fun, you know, the, the plays, you know, mm. getting people to talk to each other. Yes. And I was also rather amazed at the complexity of it because 
if you have six people, you mm. have to have 36 relationships or something. Because it's Assuming they're all interrelate, yes. Yes, mm. you know, they're all on the stage at time mm. together and things. And that was, you know, that was a challenge. But it was great fun. You know, it's interesting, it's called a play. Mm. And the whole yes. experience mm. of um, it happening and the rehearsals and all that stuff was great fun. And what made it happen? Why suddenly in 1980, 1981, did you decide to write a play? Were you commissioned or...? Um, I got very isolated writing books and I thought it would be interesting to try and write a play and the Fringe was very lively at the time mm. and this, I'd do a Fringe play and so I wrote it and I saw a play I really liked at the Duke of York's theatre and I took my play to the stage door <laughs> said, could you give that to the director? <laughs> and they did. And, um, and he... He got together with with Stratford East, mm. and they pushed on. And who was the director? Sorry, he called Roger Smith. Right. And how much input did was needed from him to make the play a lot. into a play? A, a I, lot, I guess probably you've never written one before. I'd never written one before, and uh, he helped a lot. So, so the basic technique, just not having people coming off one side and coming on the same yes, side at the that, same time yes, and things like that. All that kind of thing. Mm. All that kind of thing, which I found extremely interesting. I mm. love. I absolutely loved doing it. I loved writing plays. I haven't written very many. I wrote one which I loved too called Sisters, which was on at the um, Woolsey Theatre in Ipswich, mm. but didn't come to London. So Steaming's been my only London one. Certain, certainly I wasn't aware of any other London plays you'd written, but that could have been yes, me missing no, them. No, no, absolutely not. One called Cancer Tales that has been published that went round lots of hospitals mm. and went to various places, but, but not on the London stage. And again, the personal experience of discovering your play, which started off at say, Stratford East, ended up in the West End, splendidly for a debut play that is really quite special. Um, what did it mean to you? You're suddenly sitting at an opening night in the West End with lots of stars around, and it's your play. Well, I, I was thrilled and delighted. But I don't think... You know, I was really thrilled to see it, and I, the actors... I was just so lucky with the actors. You know, I had Brenda Blethyn and yes. Georgina Hill, both of them were mm. wonderful. So I felt very lucky and I loved it. But I wasn't terribly interested in um, kind of being with a lot of people and a lot of parties. Mm. So I th- we've probably talked about every type of writing that you've done now. <laughs> so what, what's your preference? Would you... I've done a children's book too. I apologise, a children's book as well. <laughs> so four, four different genres, arguably a lot more than that, but four different genres, maybe five, including short stories. Um, do you have a particular preference? Do you just like the variety? Probably enjoyed doing the play most because it was terrific fun having mm. actors say your lines. It was really mm. exciting. Did you get involved in the rehearsal process? I did. I did. And... Um, Playwrights, in, in a way, have a, a better time than screenwriters because mm. you are in charge. Yeah, people of listen your, to of you your, of your words, mm. and they may not put it on, mm. but they don't try and change your words. No, and did did you work with the actors as well as the director in developing yes, but it? I was told very sharply, quite near the beginning of rehearsals, that you went the writer went through the the director and mustn't speak directly to the actors. And did you abide by that? <laughs> I did. You didn't sneak yeah, around no, the no, back? I, and... <laughs> no, 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 I did, I did. And the final version of the play, did it surpass your expectations? Definitely. I'm pleased you said that. I wouldn't have hated if you'd said, no, no, it fell well short. No, definitely. <laughs> I, I, I loved it. I was, it's the thing I'm proudest of. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. That's been fascinating. As I say, Poor Cow should be in cinemas extremely soon. It'll be on Blu-ray and DVD very soon as well. Thank you so much, Nell Dan. Thank you, Philip. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.